Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob, happy Friday. Welcome back to our Top 5 Friday Ski Industry News videos. Bob, you had a lovely day out there skiing with your family, it sounds like. It was like. a long day and spring skiing all around. It was really yeah. a little bit unnerving for December 30th. I don't love having spring-like conditions on December 30th. But it, yeah. Here's the thing though, like everyone up there was having a great time. I'm sure. Like there was, other, like the biggest complaint was that it was too hot. Right. You know, from my family and from like the, the guests public, in general. The general public. Yeah. Like they could have could have been a lot of things to complain about, but everyone was having a great time. I don't consider the St. Pierre family part of the general public. No, but we certainly can voice our share of complaints, especially <laughs> the younger ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I would assume that if you were like on a family ski vacation, a holiday ski vacation here in Stowe, and you got like, I mean, two two sunny days yep. in the 40s back yeah. to back. Like that's a pretty fun environment to spend with your family. Totally, It'll and be a like, memorable ski vacation. And they don't, you know, they're they don't realize how that the trails are crowded. You know, I feel like sure. most people don't right. view that as you or I do, where we get up there and the trails are not crowded, right. and we get used to that, and then you see crowded trails, yeah. and we react differently than people that don't really know the difference. I bet some people had like the most picturesque lunch at the Cliff House today. People were eating outside. Like, Beautiful it was, views out on the deck. Yeah, yeah. No, it was awesome. Well, I, had no, I had no complaints other than like my feet were too hot. As fun as warm skiing in December is, let's all collectively cross our fingers and knock on pallet wood that it gets cold again. Yeah, and it will, but maybe not for another week. <laughs> Anyways, um, with all that said, we can get right into the week's news. Um, first, we have our FIS World Cup updates, which we typically always start with. And, you know, I've said it once and I'll say it again, that Michaela Schifrin is pretty darn good at skiing. She knows how to win a race. Sure does. And not just one, but yep. a lot of them. Yeah, so four in a row now for Michaela. Um, won three races this week. As a quick recap here, we had a giant slalom race to start, and Kayla was first. And big shout out to Paula Moltzen this week too. Was tenth in that race, followed by another giant slalom. Kayla again first place. Paula working her her way up to ninth. And then most recently that very entertaining slalom race. Yeah. Where uh, Michaela again picked up a first place, and Paula was right behind her in second. Um, did you notice that, she, like, Michaela seemed happier about Paula yes. finishing second yes. than her own victory, which I thought was pretty cool. I think there's a lot of camaraderie in that, yeah. that women's ski team. Um, no, it's it really, really cool to see. Um, Michaela, 80 wins, inching closer and closer to both the women's record and the overall record for both genders. Yeah, and no real end or ceiling in sight. Doesn't feel like she's slowing down. Right. Kind of feels like, if anything, she's getting a little bit better and better each season. All those haters back in the Olympics. That <laughs> yeah, it was like less than a year ago, right? right? They were like, she's done. Right. Look at that quitter on the yeah. side of the trail. Like, yeah, this is like the best ski racer in history. Right. But sure. It's easy to be prisoner of the moment in those situations, I think. I think there were a lot of eyes on the Olympics, too, and those yeah. people don't generally watch World Cup races. No, and we've said it before, like, World Cup is where it's at. Like, right. Olympics is great, but right. it's people are there for the World Cup. Right, and I can totally, thinking back to those Olympics, you know, like, she gets hyped up by NBC so much. Right. And then, like, you know, you don't watch ski racing. You watch ski racing once every four years, and, like, everyone on the telecast is telling you that Michaela Schifrin is the best ever, and then yeah. she, like, doesn't win. I could see I suppose I understand why somebody would yeah. point a finger, but completely unnecessarily, I think. Um, and then to finish up these uh, World Cup updates, uh, the men were in Italy, and some strong skiing from Ryan Cochran Siegel, again, picking up a 5th and a 13th. He's fast. Yeah, it's really great to see. Yep. Having a great season. So just some highlights there. Um, as always, with all of these things, I leave links in the description. So if you want to see... All the finishers, um, all the different results from the past week, just follow those links. Um, and then 
Just kind of picking up off uh, off our introductory conversation there, Bob. Um, we got a the local Vermont WCIX news station examines the change in weather and snow conditions and its effect on snowmaking. Thought this was pretty interesting. Yeah, and I kind of glanced through this, didn't read the article, but the I think there's a pretty big disconnect between what people how people perceive snowmaking and how easy it looks to how hard it actually is. Yeah. And how much energy and time and human power it takes. I think that's probably true. Um, and I thought I thought this was a very interesting article. They had an interview with Sean Patno, the uh, snowmaking manager over at Sugarbush. Yep. Um, and he kind of was talking about this typical snowmaking window. And they really kind of think of it as November, December, January, at least traditionally. So, you know, you get 91 days in that window with historically about 60 viable snowmaking days. Yeah. So call it two-thirds of the days are cold enough to make snow. That's kind of how I understand it. And in recent years, there has been a pretty significant trend of that snowmaking window getting a little bit smaller and also getting pushed back. Like and, later. Yeah. yeah. And we even are seeing kind of the same thing on the spring side of it. Like yeah. May has been cold. Right. It's So it, it just, there's been a little bit of a fundament, fundamental shift in how you can make snow and when you can make snow. Yeah. And it's just making it hard for resorts basically to get ready for this week. I mean, we're kind of seeing the results of that. Like, yeah. A lot of people want to go skiing on holiday vacation periods. At least for eastern resorts, it's it's getting harder and harder for the mountain to be 100% open or or even close to 100% open to accommodate all those all those guests. Right, which makes like like Stowe's efforts. You know, they have all their lifts open, like to the top of each. Yeah, they're peak. trying their best. Like that, right? They, and that's great. You know, I think that a lot of other resorts really struggle to get even that much open right at this point in the year absolutely yeah so not great but really interesting read uh, another thing i thought was fascinating is that the snowmaking community in general basically agrees that we are getting really really close to reaching maximum efficiency in the systems mm -hmm. and then after that the only factor is just temperatures yeah so we're basically like sort of losing the amount of control yeah. in, in potential snowmaking improvements. Um, so obviously something worth keeping an eye on uh, over the next years, decades, centuries. I right. won't be here to <laughs> check in in a century. Maybe. I don't know. Will medical technology advance enough that I will live to 137? Anything's possible, Jeff. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll check in in 100 years. Um, and then third topic of the week, uh, pretty, pretty much the polar opposite. Um, New York Times is looking at the staffing shortages in Niseko, uh, Japan. Um, they, are, they have not been lacking snow. Right. Um, borders have been closed in Japan. They're back open. Uh, and they did a little highlight of Niseko. 25,000 year-round residents, and from November to March, they're expecting 1.3 million tourists. That's a big. That's a big jump, especially over the past two years with yeah. closed borders. Right. Yeah. That's so, a huge jump. Basically, the story here is that there is a significant staffing shortage in Niseko, Japan. So, if you want to go work in Niseko, Japan, <laughs> as long as you can get a visa, you're going to get hired. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, and you're going to be getting paid decently as well. And they yeah. offer a sign-on bonus. And yeah, they're, they're really... ta talking $7,500 finders fees, yep. sign-on bonuses, super competitive offers. Yep. There was a story of like one guy that got like nine job offers in like a three-day window or right. something. So, I don't know. Yeah. If you're looking to like... I've seen a lot of like threads and, and kind of questions like... I, I'm interested in the ski bomb lifestyle and, and how is the best way to do that. Like, I don't know, maybe just go to Japan for three months. Right. Probably be pretty good. Be an opportunity of a lifetime. Um, and then lastly, this is a pretty quick one. Aspen has installed lift ticket pickup boxes 
Um, most notably, there's one at the local airport. They've got 16 of these boxes around town and one at the local airport. It's basically just a kiosk where you plug in a number or, or scan your QR code and yep. it spits you out your lift ticket. Like your, your pass, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Or lift ticket or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yep. I just like things like this where, you know, you're, what's your classic saying? No one tries anything anymore. Right. Like why make people stand in line on a lift ticket window to talk to a person to then buy their lift ticket? I mean, it's pretty much all done online anyway. I think the next right. step is coming up with a universal RFID card. Or like phones. Is there some way we could use phones? Right, so they're scanning your phone instead of... Yeah. Well, they do that with ticket, other tickets. Like right. you just have your QR code, but you don't but want to bring you your... your phone on. Yeah. And I think like you have to take it out. But I wonder if there's something like, like, could it be like Bluetooth connection from your phone or... I don't know. Yeah. But... I, I like it when people are innovating things, and I think anything to make the experience of going skiing a little bit easier and a little bit more efficient, there's a lot to be said about that. Yep. And then lastly, we have our edits of the week. Um, first up, we have Relativity from Real Ski Fee. These guys are, are they're just getting more and more impressive. I think at this point, I'm most impressed from like a videography and editing perspective. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work that goes into some of these shots that they get, and it's just very, very cool. So highly recommend checking that out. It's pretty short. And then we get two of these, um, one from MSP, one from TGR. So first we have a behind-the-scenes look at Craig Murray's kind of infamous double flat seven in the backcountry. Just went absolutely massive. Pretty cool to kind of hear that story. Yep. And then very similar from TGR, we have behind the line of Kai Jones' wall ride. So if you're into like really impressive backcountry skiing, definitely check out those. And then lastly, this is really more of a full film than an edit, but we have Wavy 2 from Black Crows, which is about 48 minutes long, just classic adventure skiing kind of documentary style. And I've been continually impressed with their production value, the Black Crows media group. Yes. Their skis are impressive. Yep. You like their outerwear. Yep. But perhaps the most impressive thing is, yeah, their commitment to putting out really, really good entertaining ski content. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty good stuff. There aren't, I can't think of many other manufacturers that can kind of match that with maybe Solomon being the, yep. the standout with yeah. Solomon Free Ski TV. So if you've got 48 minutes and you want to watch some great skiing and, and a really cool story, check that out. And I think that's it for this week's Top 5 Fridays. Bob, unless you've got something you want to add. Uh, last Top 5 of the year. Yeah. I don't, like... It's true. Is it going to be 2023? Yeah. I always get confused. Because of all the skis? Yeah. Yes. Because we're usually working a year ahead. Yes. We are still currently in the year 2022. Okay. On Sunday, it will be 2023. All right. Look forward to the hat. <laughs> Which means that we got to start talking about 2024 skis real soon. I know. It's pretty funny. We've written it a bunch of times already, and it always feels weird to could, could skip be as, a whole year. Yep. Could be as early as next week that you guys see some 2024 ski content. Maybe Crazy. may end up being the following week, but embargo dates are starting yeah. to hit. and yeah, it's Soon. It's going to be fun. It's going to be soon. Yep. Got a lot of exciting things to talk about, so... Look out for that. Have a fantastic weekend. Happy New Year, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye.